on World News Tonight. Sunak to rise. UK names their third Prime Minister in just seven weeks. Tonight, more on how Rishi Sunak makes history. Pointing fingers. Russia doubles down on allegations that Ukraine plans to use a dirty bomb in its own territory after its allies call those claims a lie. Triple demic threat. Flu season collides with an unprecedented surge in child respiratory illnesses. And Day of the Dead. Interactive offerings bring traditions to life as Mexicans set up offerings for the dead. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight with breaking news. Rishi Sunak is officially Britain's fifth Prime Minister in six years after meeting with King Charles III at Buckingham Palace. In his first speech outside 10 Downing Street, he says the UK is facing a profound economic crisis and that he has been chosen as the new Tory leader to fix some of Liz Truss's mistakes. He also vowed to put the country's needs above politics. The Prime Minister is now starting to put together his cabinet after His Majesty King Charles III asked Sunak to form a new government. Jacob Rees-Mogg, one of Boris Johnson's most loyal supporters, has resigned as a business secretary, while Brandon Lewis has stepped down as justice secretary. Wendy Morton is also out as the chief whip of the House of Commons and says she is returning back to the benches. It's worth pointing out that everyone in Liz Truss's cabinet stays in post until told otherwise. In a short farewell speech earlier, Liz Truss defended her legacy of trying to push through tax cuts and said leaders needed to be bold. Sunak is to be the UK's third leader in seven weeks after winning a Tory leadership contest triggered by Truss stepping down. Sunak has ruled out an early general election despite calls from the Labour, the Scottish National Party, the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party. Now who is Rishi Sunak, Britain's new Prime Minister? Here's a look at how he has risen to the top of British politics. It is the greatest privilege of my life to be able to serve the party I love and give back to the country I owe so much to. Who is Rishi Sunak, Britain's new Prime Minister? I am resigning. After Liz Truss's chaotic six weeks in charge, we have made mistakes. Boris Johnson's aborted comeback mission and Penny Mordaunt's failure to secure enough Tory backers. Rishi Sunak is there. 42-year-old Sunak is now at the helm of a country desperately in need of some stability. Let's take a look at how he got here. That means honesty and responsibility, not fairy tales. Southampton-born Sunak is the UK's first Prime Minister of Indian descent. His family migrated to Britain in the 1960s, a period when many people from Britain's former colonies moved to the country to help it rebuild after the Second World War. Sunak attended the exclusive private school Winchester College studied philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford University and then got an MBA from Stanford University. It was there he met his wife Akshata Murthy, whose father is Indian billionaire Narayan Murthy, founder of IT services giant Infosys. Before entering politics, Sunak worked as an analyst at Goldman Sachs and was later a partner at two hedge funds. He's thought to be one of the richest members of parliament and his wealth and private school background has come into focus during TV debates. Sunak was elected to Parliament in 2015 and had a swift rise within the Conservative Party. He campaigned for leave in the EU referendum. By 2020, aged only 39, Sunak was named Finance Minister by Boris Johnson. Delighted to be appointed, lots to get on with. Within weeks of becoming Chancellor, Sunak found himself having to steer the UK economy as the COVID-19 pandemic began. I said I would do whatever it takes. He pledged to do whatever it takes to help people through the pandemic and developed a popular furlough scheme to support millions of people through multiple lockdowns. He was also behind the Eat Out to Help Out initiative to boost the struggling hospitality sector in summer 2020. That included waiting tables at a central London eatery. There we go. In April 2022, Sunak had to deal with the fallout of being fined by police for breaking lockdown rules in Downing Street in June 2020. In that same month, he and his family's finances came under intense scrutiny. 
It was revealed that his wife, who is an Indian citizen, had not been paying her British tax on her foreign income through her non-domiciled status. The status is available to foreign nationals who do not see Britain as their permanent home. She's always followed all the rules, paid all the tax in the UK that is due and paid tax internationally on her international investments. Uh, but she recognises this goes beyond just following those rules. The revelations hurt Sunak ahead of his race against Liz Truss. Sunak eventually resigned as Chancellor in July 2022, a move that contributed to the downfall of Johnson as Tory leader and Prime Minister. Hasta la vista, baby! <laughs> During the race to replace his former boss, Sunak lost out to Truss in the last leadership contest. While some choose to label the multi-millionaire as out of touch, others believe Sunak is the person to bring some calm to the economy. We need a return to traditional conservative economic values. After all, he was proven right in his warnings that Truss's fiscal plan threatened financial stability. Sunak has pledged to bring integrity, professionalism and accountability to government. But he has a mountain to climb to try to restore or renew the reputation of the Conservative Party following one of the most turbulent periods in British political history. For the second straight day, Russia is continuing to accuse Ukraine of plotting to use a radioactive dirty bomb and blame it on Moscow. Russia's foreign minister said that the Kremlin has information about Ukrainian scientific institutions that have the technology to create such a weapon. Meanwhile, Russian missile attacks destroyed apartment blocks in the southern part of Ukraine. No fatalities, but many were injured by the explosions at night. Russia continues to accuse Ukraine of planning to use a dirty bomb before blaming it on Moscow. On Monday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Moscow has information about Ukraine having the technology to create dirty bombs. Lavrov added that Russian officials will present the issue to international agencies, including the United Nations. In addition, the Russian Defense Ministry says it has readied forces and capabilities to deal with radioactive contamination following its claims that Ukraine will use such weapons. The commander of Russia's nuclear, chemical and biological defense forces, Igor Kirillov, said Monday that Ukraine wanted to spread radioactive material in its own country with the plan of framing Russia and undermining support for Moscow worldwide. He added that Kyiv was reaching the final stage of building a nuclear weapon and is requesting support from the UK without providing any evidence of his allegations. Meanwhile, NATO General Secretary Jan Stoltenberg on Monday warned Russia over false claims that Kyiv might use a dirty bomb, adding that NATO allies reject this allegation and that Russia must not use it as pretext for escalation. The U.S., the U.K. and France gave their view of the Russian allegation in a joint statement, saying that their governments all reject Russia's transparently false allegations that Ukraine is preparing to use a dirty bomb on its own territory. The countries also stressed that they would continue supporting Ukraine in the face of President Putin's brutal war of aggression. There is concerning health news in the USA, which is the triple threat of respiratory viruses, including RSV affecting children, and more U.S. states are reporting on a shortage of pediatric hospital beds. Tonight, growing concerns over a possible triple-demic this winter. The flu, RSV, and COVID converging. Cases keep rising much earlier than usual. Nearly half of a Virginia high school, about 1,000 students, were out Friday with flu-like symptoms. Classes resume today after administrators canceled some weekend activities. A major pharmacy now says flu activity at its clinics has more than doubled over the past two weeks. Rhode Island, Delaware, Maine, and Washington, D.C. now report more than 90% of their pediatric hospital beds are full. Several other states between 80 and 90%. Many patients battling RSV, a common respiratory illness that's usually like a simple cold, but can be very serious in children under two or older adults. In Providence, Rhode Island, Hasbro Children's Hospital is now at 125% capacity. Extra patients staying in the emergency department while they wait for available beds to be admitted. Another problem, recently more pediatric units across the country have closed, straining the system. We're bringing patients into areas of the hospital that we never used before and we are trying to sort of relocate staff to those areas to, to best care for them. 
Just like the US, South Korean health authorities have warned of a potential surge in seasonal viruses among children this winter. Without antibodies to fight viruses like the flu, the metanunovirus and RS, infants born during the pandemic could be at serious risk. To make sure they get treated quickly this winter, children with respiratory symptoms can be taken directly to specialist medical centers or the emergency room instead of having to wait for the results of a PCR test for COVID. With flu season coming up, South Korean health authorities have stressed the importance of a medical response system for infants and children. They also warn that children could be at risk of contracting other respiratory viruses this winter too, such as metanumovirus and RS. Any children that do show symptoms are now able to be taken directly to a respiratory medical facility or pediatrics for immediate treatment instead of having to wait for a PCR test result. While adults may have been exposed to them without realizing it, viruses such as these can be harmful to infants. And because of social distancing, children born during the pandemic are unlikely to have antibodies to fight against them. When asked when the indoor mask mandate would be lifted, the same official said that it's still premature to discuss it. He said even if the indoor mask mandate was to be lifted, they would still need to be worn for a while on public transport and in medical facilities even after the pandemic is declared over by DWHO. Meanwhile, South Korea saw 14,302 new cases of COVID-19 on Monday, 226 severe cases were reported and 10 additional deaths. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. EU environment ministers agreed their negotiating position for the COP27 climate conference in Sharm el-Sheikh following a battle of wills between capitals over the bloc's level of ambition at the annual UN climate summit. With the international climate gathering, COP27, just around the corner, the EU is getting ready. Environment ministers met Monday in Luxembourg to agree on a text to take to the negotiations in Sharm el-Sheikh. With the use of coal on the rise since the war in Ukraine, ministers insisted the dirty fuel would not derail EU climate ambitions. The one conclusion we've drawn from the war is that we need to speed up our energy transition. So even if we use a bit more coal today, we will be going much faster in our energy transition. So on balance, our emissions will be reduced even faster than before. At the COP26 in Glasgow, countries agreed to phase down their use of coal, even China and India. But since the war in Ukraine, Germany, Austria, Italy and the Netherlands all announced temporary measures to use it. Onlookers worry about this regression and the lack of net zero commitments from the corporate and financial world. COP27 will also look at setting up a fund to help countries severely impacted by climate change. The pressure is already on politicians, with thousands taking to the streets of Brussels last weekend. South and North Korea have exchanged warning shots near the northern limit line, the disputed maritime border between the two Koreas. South Korea is strongly urging the North to immediately stop such acts, saying they pose a threat to regional peace and security. At about 3.42 a.m. on Monday, a North Korean merchant ship briefly crossed the northern limit line in waters west of the Korean Peninsula, before retreating after warnings from the south. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff announced that the ship intruded on the border about 27 kilometers northwest of its Pyongyangdo island. An official from the JCS said the ship came as close to the border as 3.3 kilometers north of the de facto border, and retreated an hour later at about 4.20 a.m following numerous messages and warning shots from the south. Then, at about 5.14 a.m., the North fired 10 shells from multiple rocket launchers, according to South Korea's military. The North's military also said in a statement on Monday morning that it fired 10 artillery shells, claiming that a South Korean Navy ship intruded on their western sea border as well. Seoul's military called the North's claims absurd, as it had conducted normal operations regarding the border intrusion. It also called the North's latest move a provocation, as the artillery shells fired by the regime landed in maritime buffer zones set by an inter-Korean military agreement in 2018 to reduce military tensions.
North Korea firing artillery rounds in response to a normal operation by our military after a North Korean merchant ship crossed the NLL is clearly a provocation and a violation of the September 19th military agreement. We repeatedly urge North Korea to immediately halt its absurd claims and provocations that harm peace and stability on the Korean peninsula, as well as the international community. The maritime boundary in waters off the Korean peninsula has been a source of tense military incidents between the two Koreas, as Pyongyang has refused to acknowledge the northern limit line as its maritime border. The Trump Organization stands trial this week in what prosecutors allege was a 15-year scheme to compensate top executives of former President Donald Trump's company off the books to help them avoid paying taxes with the company's former chief financial officer appearing as the prosecution's star witness. Jury selection began on Monday in the tax fraud trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump's family business a case in which the Trump Organization is accused of awarding off-the-books benefits to some senior executives. Attorney William Brennan is defending the firm. We're figuring it's going to be probably a good, solid week for jury selection. You know. The trial opened after the Manhattan District Attorney's Office last year charged Trump's namesake real estate company and Alan Weisselberg, its then chief financial officer. In August, Weisselberg pleaded guilty to helping the company defraud tax authorities for 15 years in an agreement with prosecutors that requires him to testify at this trial. The charges to which Weisselberg pleaded guilty included grand larceny and tax fraud, and he admitted concealing $1.76 million in income. As a result, lawyers for the Trump Organization have said they're prepared to accuse the longtime CFO of lying. The Trump Organization, which operates hotels, golf courses, and other real estate around the world, could face up to $1.6 million in fines for the three tax fraud counts and six other counts it faces. The company has pleaded not guilty. Trump himself is not charged in the case. The criminal tax trial is but one of the legal hurdles facing the former president. We are filing a lawsuit against Donald Trump for violating the law as part of his efforts to generate profits for himself, his family, and his company. Last month, the New York Attorney General filed a $250 million lawsuit against Trump, three of his adult children, and his company accusing them of overstating asset values and his net worth to get favorable bank loans and insurance coverage. He also faces a criminal investigation in Georgia related to election meddling and a Justice Department probe into allegations he illegally retained classified materials after he left office. Negotiators for the Ethiopian government and regional forces from Tigray were due to meet in the South African capital, Pretoria, for the first formal peace talks since war broke out two years ago. The talks come after the Ethiopian military and their allies, who include troops from neighboring Eritrea, captured several large towns in Tigray, a region in northern Ethiopia, over the past week. As the Ethiopian government and Tigray forces meet for peace talks, the international community watches on anxious for an end to nearly two years of brutal conflict. I appeal to political leaders to end the suffering of the defenseless people and find equitable solutions for lasting peace throughout Ethiopia. May the efforts of the parties for dialogue and the pursuit of the common good lead to a concrete path of reconciliation. Tigray has been decimated by the war, which broke out in late 2020. At the time, leaders of the region's dominant party, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, grew critical of the government for attempting to centralize power. A peace deal struck with neighbors Eritrea over disputed territory was also met with disdain. In September that year, Tigray held its own regional elections, an act Addis Ababa declared illegal. And fighting erupted two months later, when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered an offensive, accusing TPLF forces of attacking government army camps. Tens of thousands are believed to have since been killed Millions uprooted and hundreds of thousands left on the brink of famine. A year-long communications blackout in Tigray has also made independent reporting of the real numbers nearly impossible. Over two years of conflict, as many as half a million, half a million people have died. The scale of the fighting and deaths rival what we're seeing in Ukraine and innocent civilians are being caught in the crossfire. Heavy clashes resumed in August shattering a five-month-long ceasefire and preventing desperately needed humanitarian aid from reaching the Tigray region. As recently as last week, Ethiopian government forces continued to make significant territorial gains. Now backed by the Eritrean army, 
Addis Ababa has declared the capture of several large towns while promising to take control of airports and other federal sites in Tigray. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 14 people died after an Indonesian boat caught fire while at sea near the province of East Nusa Tenggara. At least 312 people have been rescued. Despite a ban, a lot of firecrackers were lit and as a result, the pollution level in India rose and increased problems for everyone. Residents in India are facing difficulties in breathing due to air pollution. Comic actor Leslie Jordan, a primetime Emmy winner for his role in the hit sitcom Will and Grace and a social media sensation during COVID-19 pandemic, died in a car crash while driving to work in Hollywood. Three Palestinians were killed during clashes with Israeli security forces who had entered a flashpoint city in the occupied West Bank. Arshad Sharif, a well-known Pakistani journalist, was killed in Nairobi when police hunting car thieves opened fire on a vehicle he was travelling in as the car drove through their roadblock without stopping. And that is all the news from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with oversized skeletons dancing with the living in a giant interactive offering installed in Mexico City. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.